I turn on my mic. How do you go from being a fiery hothead wanting to call down fire on the Samaritans to this sweet-spirited apostle calling on believers to love one another? I mean, it's, it's just incredible if you look at the life of John. How did he go from being this self-seeking son of thunder to calling himself and each of us a child of God? It's just a, a dramatic a, a series of events that brings this about. Richard Foster and others point to John's time with Jesus, saying if, if you think about John, he was one of the first two of the disciples to start following Jesus, and he was the last one that remained at the cross. So certainly he was impacted by the story of Jesus, and being there on the inner circle and seeing everything that transpired, certainly it shaped him. But John, if he were here with us this morning, would also point to another member of the Godhead, he would point to the Holy Spirit that helped bring about this dramatic change in his life. If you remember, John was most likely the last of the Gospels that was completed. And so he's writing to the early church. And in essence, you've got a bunch of fledgling congregations that are just getting started up. And so John has the benefit of having Matthew, Mark, and Luke already completed, the Synoptic Gospels. And so what John is trying to do is, is write to these early churches that are just getting going and saying, what else do you need? What else from the story of Jesus is missing? So it's almost like we have a supplemental material. And he's saying, this is what you need to hear. And so as, as we take a, a look at, at what he's doing, what the church is, is dealing with is that some believers, the, the Gnostics, were tend on kind of watering down the gospel. So that's what John's dealing with. Also a lack of unity and love that he's trying to address. And this lack of unity and love it is playing out in the life of, of the congregations where they can't go out and advance the kingdom. And finally, he's, he's addressing anxiety over the future. Everyone was worried about, uh, you know, if, if we stand up for our faith, are we going to be persecuted? So I'm glad that these three things we don't lo no longer have to deal with today as a church. Well, of course we do. So John says, I've got to address this. And so I've got to, as I'm writing my gospel, I want to tell the Jesus story in a way that's going to bring about this life transformation. So John's solution, a better understanding of the work and the wonder of the Holy Spirit. If, if you look at what John tried to put into his gospel, he talks more about the Holy Spirit than the other three synoptics combined. And so John says, if we're going to understand what it means to be the church, we've got to understand the Holy Spirit. We have to understand what this is all about. And so for John, for us to have life in community, we've also got to have life in the Spirit. I have to tell you, maybe it's just me in, in my upbringing, but every time we start talking about the Holy Spirit, do you guys get a little nervous? I mean, man, we're, we're talking about the Holy Spirit here, and uh, man, generally our fellowship has kind of defined theology of, of the Spirit based on what we don't believe, not really what we do believe, and so as most of us were kind of raised in one of two types of churches. The first was, well, the Holy Spirit is the spiritual equivalent of Pandora's box, right? And it's just better not to crack the lid even a little bit on that, because if you do, it's going to lead you down the road, and before you know, you'll be snake handling with Pentecostals. And so it's just better just take a step back, and let's not open that can of worms. Let's just leave the Holy Spirit alone. The other approach that many churches is, well, we're just not going to talk about it at all. If you remember in Acts chapter 19, Paul walks into Ephesus, and he meets with some of the believers there, and he asks them, okay, you guys have, have come to faith, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And this was their response in Acts 19 and verse 2. They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And that was kind of my approach, or that's kind of my upbringing. When I headed off to college and people were talking about the Holy Spirit and different things, I'm like, what is that? You know, and, and so I was kind of raised that, you know, God did some awesome stuff in the Old Testament and Jesus did some really cool stuff in, 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 in the Gospels. And then the Holy Spirit kind of did his thing, inspiring scripture. And then all three kind of took a step back. And we're here to kind of work things out. Start hearing some different things about the Holy Spirit. And so as we, we start looking about this, you know, we, we look that 
Maybe the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction for some people. And it, when you start talking about the Holy Spirit, boy, they, they have all kinds of experience and all kinds of things that they're talking about. And, and it appears that the Holy Spirit is very active in their life in a personal way. And the Spirit leads them to do all kinds of things. And you're just kind of going, well, well that's kind of neat. I, I don't really know how to respond to that. And so this becomes their own personal thing that, that's within them. And we were talking on Wednesday night in Roger Harwell's class, and he kind of shared that that's kind of a Western way of looking at faith, that it, it's kind of we've got our own little bubble, our own little experience between us and God and us and the Spirit and us and Jesus. And we're trying to work through that, and, and church kind of helps with that. And you know, we enjoy hanging out with other people that are on their own spiritual quest. And if they kind of align with me, well, I don't mind being with them. But yet when we look in Scripture, we see that the encounters of the Spirit, and we're talking about this, usually happen within a group of people. And so we're looking at what Scripture lays out for us, Acts chapter 2. Of course, we, we have the, the big coming of the Holy Spirit at, at Pentecost there in Jerusalem. And then we see that the, the people from Samaria in Acts chapter 8 receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, we have the household of Cornelius. And then as, as we're reading some of Paul's material, and he's talking about what the Spirit brings, a lot of that is gifts and encounters that happen within the body of believers as we come together to worship, as we come together to commune. God gives us these gifts to bless one another, encourage one another, and strengthen one another. We'll talk about that later on in this series. We talk about the spiritual gifts. So in reality, what we're seeing here is that spiritual gifts lead to a spirit-filled community. It's not just an individual thing. So it becomes a communal event, something that we look forward to together, and as the Spirit works with us collectively. You know, and if John sees the coming of Spirit as a source of life and hope for the church, what I want us to do today is there's a lot of different passages on the Holy Spirit. I just want to look at, at what John had to say and some of the things that he brought to life as we see this transformation that took place in his own life. If you have your Bibles, turn to me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Well, the disciples have been with Jesus for three years. And so they, I, we don't know exactly if there was much coming and going, but for three years they've been kind of traveling with Jesus and, and witnessing a tremendous amount of stuff. And so as they're working out their faith, and expanding their idea of what the kingdom is, a lot of that has been based on being side by side with Jesus Christ. And so they're witnessing these things. And so they've kind of grown dependent upon Jesus. And he's about to tell them, I'm getting ready to go. I'm no longer going to be with you. And they don't know what to do. They don't know how to live. And it had to be troubling for them to Jesus to announce this. So he comforts them with these words in John chapter 14 and verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So he goes on to explain to him, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. So that's where I'm going. And I'm, I'm not going to leave you here as, as orphans. There's going to be something that's going to come to fill this daily void that you're feeling with me stepping out from your life. And so the daily presence. So God's going to send his spirit to indwell them. And when this comes to pass, we'll see at Pentecost, the spirit-filled community is about to emerge. And so we have these people uh, that are very close to Jesus and have been following around, and those are going to serve as, as kind of a starting point and a catalyst. But this thing is about to take off because the crowds have been following Jesus. Some come in for a while and some leave. But it's about to change everything when the Holy Spirit comes to be a part and shape this faith, this Spirit-filled community. Well, what are the marks of the Holy Spirit that, that John tries to give them to get ready for this coming to be a part of them? The, the first is obedience. John makes the case in his writings that there's going to be a connection between love and obedience and the presence of the Spirit. So let's see how this kind of ties in with John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. So if, if, if you're buying into what's about to happen, 
And you're going to witness what I do on the cross on your behalf. And when that sinks in and you see the power available to raise me from the dead, if you're going to push all your chips onto the table and say, I am in with you, with you, and God, I love you, okay? You're going to obey my commandments. You're going to bring your life in alignment. He said, then I will bring a counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. So in essence, we confirm the presence of God by how we, as the body of Christ, live together. Does that make sense? And so the world's not going to understand that. But obedience brings about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also brings about obedience. Kind of a hard thing to understand. But the more we're in tune with what God would have us to do in following after His ways, the more the Spirit takes an active role in our life. And the more the Spirit is active and working in our lives, the easier it is for us to understand truth and follow after that. So they kind of dovetail in with one another. So if we love Jesus and are so consumed by His love that He first demonstrated for us, we'll obey God's teachings, aligning our ways with God's truth. Think of it like a, a stereo. Almost if, if we can tune in to God's frequency and say, that's the station I want it to be on with, with our Heavenly Father following the life of Jesus and the ways of the Lord laid out in Scripture. We're saying, okay, God, you've revealed to us what it looks like to follow after you if we follow after what Jesus did. Just try to do Jesus' stuff in our lives and see what's laid out in Scripture and say, that's what I'm going to go after. God says, I can give you an extra measure of, your spirit, of my spirit to help you accomplish that. So we have this obedience and love in the spirit all coming together as one. And so people start seeing that. And folks can't put their finger on it, but there is a spirit about a church or group of people that's just different. And so they may deny our Heavenly Father, and they may say, this isn't going to serve as a guide for my life because I don't buy into your version of truth, but they can't deny that we buy into it, that we're following after Jesus Christ. We're Christ followers that have so consumed us because when they're around the body of Christ, they see something different, something they haven't experienced on their own. And people around this group of believers, they should pick up on the fact that we're different. Our language should be different than the world around us. Our marriages should model the love that Christ has for the church. Our children should be following in the ways of the Lord. And our work ethic in the marketplace should be second to none. People should see that we're working not for our, our earthly bosses, but for our Heavenly Father. And so there's just something about it they can't quite put their finger on, but we reveal to them it's because of our love for our Heavenly Father and the Spirit that's working within us. The way that we love, the way we encourage, the way that we serve out in the community bears witness to the faith and what God is doing inside of us through the work of the Holy Spirit. So it bears witness to the presence of the Spirit among us. 1 John 3 and verse 23 and 24, John says this, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave to you. So if, if we are not only obedient, people are going to see that there's less and less of us showing up and more of the spirit coursing through our veins. God's taken a root in us. And so that becomes the first marker of the spirit within us is this obedience. The second thing that will begin to show up if, the, if we are a spirit-filled community is power. You know, going back to the, the upper room, Jesus tries to put them at ease, and, and just because he's returning to the Father, he says his ministry and this ushering in the kingdom, all the stuff we've been doing, he said that's not going to just stop and say, man, we had a good run. Wasn't it an awesome, awesome three years? He said, no, this is going to not only continue, it's going to get ramped up. Look in John 14 and verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father's in me. 
or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Okay, so you know me and God are, are, are together. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to Father and will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Wow. What he's saying here is we can start doing Jesus stuff. What did Jesus do? He healed people. He brought in the kingdom. He proclaimed the gospel message. And so presumably God's spirit is going to empower us to do those things too. Some of you are going, wait, wait, wait. You're talking about healing? See the whole Pandora box? We should have closed that thing, locked it down. James chapter 5 says, if you're sick, assemble the elders of the church for prayer. There's power that comes out of this righteous assembly. Do we believe what's written here in Scripture? Are we to say, well, it's just kind of a nice notion. Do we literally call upon the shepherds to come over? Do we believe that, that there's power in there that we can't access on our own? I, I'm not saying we look at this as a checklist. Symbol elders, anoint with oil, lift, lift up righteous prayers, receive healing, done. I, I'm, I'm not saying that that's the way it works, but nor am I willing to dismiss the power of God that I have seen show up in assemblies of God's people and his community beyond anything that can be experienced out in the world. I have known of, of churches that have prayed for properties for years that were not on the market and without solicitation have owners come up and either offer to give that property to the church or offer it at a reduced market value. I know of missionaries' homes that when a large jungle fire came through in Africa, only their house was spared around that. Stuff that you just can't quite explain. I personally have received funds for, for mission projects that I've received from people that I've never met that have called and said, can I go to lunch with you and hand me a check and say, you don't know me, but I felt like that the Spirit was putting on my heart to give you a check for what you're getting ready to go do. If it fits into his plan, if it brings glory to his Father and advances the kingdom, Jesus says, there is power through the Spirit to bring it about. I have to tell you, there's nothing more convincing than when you see the power of God show up among us. When there's things that, that transpire that we can't explain, Sometimes that we can't even imagine. But it's not of our strength. It has to be a God thing. That's encouraging. We see God's power. And finally, the coming of the Spirit, I believe, brings peace. This is not the sort of peace that, that we kind of search after in the world. And we talk about getting peace talks together. As you think about it, the Pax Romana was, uh, began with the ascension of um, Augustus in 27 B.C., and it kind of marked the end of the Roman Republic and the end of all the civil wars. And this continued from 27 B.C. to 180 A.D. with the death of Marcus Aurelius. So technically, during the whole ministry and time of Christ, they were under peace. And, and, and the Roman world and all of the, the providence and stuff, they were at peace. But this peace was brought about and was won and maintained at the point of the sword and the spear. But that's not what we're talking about here. The peace that's promised by the coming of the Spirit doesn't necessarily bring it into political turmoil that we see up in, in Washington and around the world. It, it, it doesn't end economic upheaval or racial tension or even international terrorism. It has the power to. But what Jesus is talking about is the inner tranquility within the body of Christ that people around don't understand. When our world should be coming unraveled, we have a peace that passes understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit within us. John 14 and verse 25 says this, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace, I leave with you my peace. A peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. The tail end of this section, John includes a story that's left out by some of the other gospel writers. 
on the night of the resurrection, you can imagine, a couple of them have heard of sightings that, that, that Jesus has been raised from the dead, but they're still scared to death. Where are they? They're back in a room, and they have the doors locked for fear of the Jews. They're afraid they're going to be captured, arrested, and perhaps crucified as well. Everything about their life is unstable. They don't know if the ministry is going to continue on. They don't know if Jesus is going to return to them. He says he's leaving them. Where, do they go back home? Do they go back and start fishing? They're not sure exactly what's going to happen, but they're terrified in this lockdown room. And Jesus appears among them, and in John 20 and verse 19, it says, Peace be with you. Imagine just walking in peace. After he said to them, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. And the Father has sent me, and I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Has the church ever helped you in a time where you've been very anxious? I know as, as a young parent, when Maggie, our, our first, had a high fever, it's the first time she had been sick, we were terrified. But there was an older woman that came over and helped us and said, this will pass. It, it happens. And it, it just gave us a, a sense of security. Well, what about the first time that your son or daughter gets a detention at school and you think they have chosen the path of the world they're going off and you have someone that pulls you aside and says listen Sam Quentin will wait that's a few years down the road this is just a bump just just roll with it what about when you've lost a job and you feel like okay my whole world has been built around this a lot of my identity and now that's gone what am I going to how are we going to revive we're going to walk through this together as a family we're going to be body of people that's going to bring about peace in your life and so sometimes when, when we have these people around us it helps us we know that there's a body of believers that's going to help us weather the storm so Jesus walks in and he talks to his guys he says calm down be at peace everything's going to be all right you're going to get ready to do the things you saw me doing and you're going to have access to the power to make it happen be at peace. God's going to take care of you like he took care of me. Well, they did not receive the full measure of the Spirit, Spirit for another 50 days at Pentecost. What does the Lord do? He breathes upon them the Holy Spirit to give them what they needed, to calm their nerves, to go back and wait. Wait on God. Can you imagine? They want to do anything but wait there in Jerusalem. They want to take off and flee and run for their lives. And Jesus is like, be at peace. God is going to take care of you. It's all going to be okay. You'll understand complete with what it is. But right now, you've got to trust in me. Trust in my Heavenly Father. Right out of college, we went with a team of vocational missionaries to plant a church up in Windsor, Connecticut. And the, and the idea is we'd all move up from the south and, and move to Connecticut and help start a, a church where there wasn't one in the Windsor area, which is just south of Massachusetts. And so if we could plan a church where it was desperately needed, it would be fantastic. The problem was some people immediately, especially the ones that had already been established um, out in the working world, were able to hop into the working world pretty quick. But those of us that were fresh out of, of college walked in, and the job market wasn't all that great. And so I got up there and did a whole host of, of odd jobs. I worked for a painter. I mowed some yards. I did... All, uh, temporary work. I did everything I could just to survive and stay up there. And through a connection in the church, I was able to get a job interview at something I was excited about that tied in with my major at an advertising firm way down in West Haven, Connecticut. About an hour away, but I said, you know what? If I get this job, I'll move to where I'm closer and I can be halfway in between. And so anyway, I figure now on the map is going to take me about an hour. So I left an hour and a half before my interview. Now, if those of you that are familiar with Connecticut, there's a couple ways that you can go from Windsor, way up top, all the way down to West Haven. You can take the easy route, which is um, I-91, and it, it's a quick shop. Sometimes there's some traffic. But then there's the older road that it replaced, which is called the Merritt Parkway. And the Merritt Parkway is just beautiful. It has uh, trees and stuff that kind of grow over it. And each of the townships, way back when, 
were in a competition and each got their own architect to uh, plan the bridge that was going to go over this, this new road that was going through the Merritt Parkway. And so as you're driving along, you get to see each of these bridges that was put together by the townships as you're driving down this hour-long trip down. So I thought, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to put myself at ease. I'm not going to face the traffic on you know, I-91. I'm just going to go straight down the Merritt Parkway. Well, I got about oh, a third of the way down, and my old Volkswagen engine started giving out. It started losing some power, and I'm like, this is not the time for this to happen. And sure enough, I broke down on kind of a remote road. There was a little bit of traffic. But there I am on the side of the road, and I, I lifted up the back and, and trying to work on the engine, couldn't get it going. So now I've got grease on my hands, and I'm late for a job interview, so I didn't know what to do. And so I just abandoned the car. And it's not like roads around here where you see service stations. You're out there in the country. And so I just started walking towards my interview, not knowing what was going to happen, just started praying up a storm. And I said, Lord, I really need this job. And I, I tried hitchhiking, even though my parents told me not to do that. But no one would, would, um, would pull over for me. I guess I looked kind of scary in my suit carrying a leather binder. I don't know why. Uh, no one pulled over. But about 45 minutes in, it seemed like a lot longer than that. A gentleman pulled over on the side of the road. And so I'm like, well, great. But now it's kind of scary because you're like, who is this guy that would actually pull over and, and help? And so he rolled down his window and he introduced himself as the preacher of the Stanford Church of Christ. And I just kind of looked up and just smiled and said, God, what, what are you doing today? You know, and so I explained to him what was going on that my car, he goes, yeah, I saw your car on, uh, further up the, the parkway. He said, let's not worry about that. Let's just get you to your interview. He said, I do have a mechanic that uh, I know that that's in New Haven. I'll call him. He's a brother in the church as well. He'll come get your car and tow it. I didn't know any of these folks. I need my keys. And he said, all right, let's go. And so he takes me. And so by the time we show up at the ad agency, I'm an hour and a half late for my interview. This is before cell phones. I couldn't exactly call anyone. So I, I walk in the ad agency and I went into the restroom. I just washed my hands, washed my face, tried to fix my hair a little bit. And I went and I walked up to the receptionist and I said, well, I'm here for an interview. Is Tom Curtis available? About that time, the phone rings, and she picks it up, and she says, just a second, just have a seat. And so I went and kind of sat down. And while she was on the phone, it wasn't 30 seconds later that doors of a boardroom opened up, and about 10 people filed out. The last person that came up said, hi, I'm Tom Curtis. You must be Brad Cox uh, here for an interview. I'm sorry to keep you waiting for an hour and a half, if your references check out, the job is yours. I said, no problem at all. I, <laughs> I winked at the receptionist, and she just started cracking up, and I followed Tom and got the job. I have to tell you that when I got home that night, I, I, I wish I could tell you that my car was great. The engine was toast, and I had to get another one. But when I got home that night, I felt a sense of invincibility, and not in an arrogant way, but a way of, of saying, Lord, if I'm here and I'm on mission for you, and I'm giving my life in this period of my life for you and what you want to do, and I'm trying to be obedient to you, I know that I can be at peace. I know that there's power, and you do things that I can't explain. And I know that even though I'm not connected with anyone else in this state, the body of Christ is there. The body of Christ is powerful. And there's strength in community that can't be explained by this world. And I just pray that we truly can be a spirit-filled community that witnesses to others. Let, let's pray together. Lord, we believe on the day of Pentecost that power from heaven came down. We believe that that power was of you, O Lord, turning dis despairing doubters like John into dynamic disciples, energizing them to be witnesses of your son, Jesus Christ, in a very secular society. Lord, we believe in the indwelling. Help them to see what your kingdom was all about and help John set aside his agenda, grab a hold of your agenda. Lord, we believe that that same power of your spirit is available for us today and the Twickenham family. 
Lord, as a community, fill us. Lord, that we may be convicted of our sin and choose righteousness and obedience. Fill us, O Lord, that we may trust in your power to accomplish your mission. And fill us, O Lord, that we may be agents of peace in a turbulent world. In this we pray, amen. D.L. Moody said this, you might as well try to hear without ears or breathe without lungs as try to live a Christian life without the Spirit of God in your heart. This morning, I, I pray that if your heart is wanting, you will not leave here until you get some wise counsel and have a brother pray over you. Our shepherds will be available in this lobby over here. I pray that the Spirit will guide this congregation. We truly can be and experience life and community.